Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's exclusive preview of Yuri Shimojo's Memento Mori painting series and panel discussion featuring Shimojo, Boston-based Praise Shadows art gallery owner, Ing Ru Chen, Duke Class of 01, and Duke art history professor, Jennifer Weisenfeld. We are thrilled that tonight's event was highlighted in Sunday's New York Times. I'm Madhavi Strasberger, Duke Asian Alumni Alliance co-chair and DAAA representative on Duke Boston. And I'm Ruta Laukin, Demon Representative for Duke Boston, and I wanted to welcome all our alumni living here in the Boston area, as well as those joining us from Japan, China, South Korea, and Singapore, and also members of Demon and DAA. Before we begin, we also want to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors of tonight's event, Duke Boston, Demon, Duke Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies, Duke Asian Alumni Alliance, the Duke Student Wellness Center, Duke Arts, Duke Create, Duke Undergraduate Certificate in East Asian Studies, and last but not least, Duke Asian American Diaspora Studies Program. Please note that we are recording this program tonight to stream later on Demon Live. Tonight, we are excited to hear from our talented panel and then open up to questions and answers from you, our audience. Please post your questions in the Q&A. But first, it is my pleasure to briefly introduce to our panelists for the evening. You can find uh, their full bios in the event invitation. Joining us tonight, we have Ng Chen, who graduated from Duke University in 2001 with degrees in art history and comparative area studies. She's the founder and CEO of the new Boston-based Prey Shadows Art Gallery. It's a hybrid space emphasizing exhibitions by emerging and mid-career contemporary artists and a retail space for books and smaller works. Gallery also provides mentorship for young talent in the greater Boston area. And today the gallery opened exhibit by Yuri Shimojo, who was born in 1966 in Tokyo. She's the last descendant of a samurai clan who lost all of her immediate family members before the age 30. Yuri used painting as a way to express the interconnected emotions of joy and pain. She paints the traditional Japanese watercolor or ground sumi and shu ink, and her works are a combination of abstract and surreal, often playful, and always evocative of the desire for universal compassion. And the panel today will be moderated by Jennifer Weisenfeld, professor in the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies. Jennifer received her PhD from Princeton University in Japanese art history, and her field of research is modern and contemporary Japanese art history, design and visual culture. And now I would like to turn over to our panelists. Thank you very much. Ing, it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I remember our seminar together very well, and uh, it's just great to see you. You were actually uh, in one of the first classes of graduating seniors that I taught when I first arrived at Duke. So I don't think you knew this, but we were we were really kind of graduating together in a sense. And uh, tell us a little bit about your experience at Duke and um, how it's launched you on your current path. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you to Duke alumni and to all the organizers. This has been an incredible opportunity for uh, me and for Yuri um, and to Jennifer, who was the art history professor that changed everything for me. I transferred to Duke as um, actually a, technically a senior, and I did two years at Duke. I had been at Williams College where I started my art history program uh, and degree and I transferred to Duke as an athlete <laughs> and I was um, one of these hardcore coxswains on the crew team. I was the captain of the crew team and I knew I was going there to uh, basically help start the division one program. Um, but I also had had this really kind of daunting experience uh, the summer before I transferred to Duke where I was an intern at a gallery and had such a mundane experience and I thought well if this is art history and this is a career in art history I don't think I want to do it uh, so I told myself I would take one more art history class and if I liked it then I would continue and that history class art history class is yours Jennifer which was the fascist art of uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan of World War II. And that graduate seminar just changed everything for me because I learned that it wasn't about 
you know, just about connoisseurship or objects, but it was about visual culture. And I started applying it to everything that I saw around me. Um, and then I graduated with an art history degree and went on to work in the arts for 20 plus years. So I really owe this to you, Jennifer. Um, it, it truly is because of your class. Well, that's incredibly kind of you to say, but I feel like uh, you know, we've, um, it's definitely been this amazing partnership and you've had this incredible career in the arts since, since you were at Duke. Can you walk us through your career journey a little and for sure. the um, students and the alums who are listening, maybe you have some tips or uh, advice on, on how you've gotten to where you are? Yeah, well, my very first job outside uh, for after I graduated was Actually, it was, it's kind of interesting because talk about disaster and talk about, you know, coming out of disaster. Um, I was hired for my first job at the Asia Society in New York, and uh, I was hired the week of 9-11. So there was just so much going on in the world and in New York. But what happened was I, I realized that my training, you know, at the Asia Society was so pertinent to what was happening uh, with politics and with the world. And we were, you know, showing exhibitions that had to do with um, Afghanistan, the Taliban and talks. And I was working with amazing artists. Um, then I went on to uh, MoMA PS1 where I was the press director. And, um, and then I was also uh, an art specialist at Sotheby's in Chinese works of art. I went really old school. I, I decided to work with some antiquities for a little bit. So I have a huge breadth of experience, you know, going from contemporary modern working with living artists to uh, looking at objects from antiquity. And I love all of it. Um, and then I also did, a, you know, four years at a really amazing startup called Tatley, where I learned about uh, retail, I learned about how to start a business. Um, all of that was integral to what ended up happening with my current situation with Prey Shadows Art Gallery. And I have just been able to kind of synthesize all of the things that I've learned um, in these 20 years of working in nonprofits and for profits and startups. That really is what this gallery is about. And that's why I have so many different programs and ideas. Um, but one of the main components of the program is that I have a mentorship program for high school kids in the Boston area because it's uh, it's you know known widely in the art world that to work in the arts um, is quite difficult. And when I was doing these internships, sometimes I couldn't take them because they were unpaid. So um, to kind of create a more equitable you know landscape for um, people who work and promote artists, um, we have this program where it's a paid program, a mentorship for high school students. And uh, we have two wonderful people and they work with a professional curator in Boston and the two high school students get to put on a group exhibition this summer. So I'm really trying to also look to the future and look to people who can um, do great things as well in the art world. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, but you know, Jennifer, I know that you have done so much work and I, I want to just highlight you briefly too. Um, you know, you've worked so extensively on the relationship between art and disaster, especially the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about that work and especially your book, Imaging Disaster. Thank you for asking. Yes, I wrote a book on the Great Kanto Earthquake, which was a massive earthquake that destroyed Tokyo and five surrounding prefectures in on September 1st, 1923. Uh, at the time, it was the largest natural disaster in the world. Uh, it killed over 100,000 people, um, destroyed almost half of the capital. And uh, it's just, it was such an interesting project to launch into because really what I found was that um, disasters are not just one thing, they're um, a multiplicity and they are as diverse and unfold over time because they represent um, the disaster communities that experience them and those communities are not a monolith. So they tend to have a very diverse kinds of responses, including the artistic community, which is so important. Um, in fact, Japan um, as a country has had such a long tradition of dealing with disasters and um, over a millennia of responses. And it, it's really shaped the culture there of resilience and response 
And um, art has been such an important way that people have rebounded from these uh, types of disastrous experiences. And um, it's ultimately, I think disaster is really a kind of a paradox. Mm -hmm. uh, it's destructive, but it's also um, constructive. It's kind of horrific, but also sublime in its visuals and also in the way it provides opportunities for people to reflect and renew and, um, and kind of take stock. And um, we definitely find that over and over again in Japan, that, that, that experience, that big takeaway is that it's really a mixture of all of these things. It's heterogeneous, it's both destructive and creative and constructive and, um, and, and provides opportunities in some uh, deeply ironic ways uh, for whether it's man-made or natural, it, it provides these kinds of opportunities. And, and sadly, these types of things are, are forever timely because as you said, um, you know, whether it's Hurricane Katrina or COVID or other types of calamities, we're constantly dealing with this in a global situation. And that's something that um, artists around the world are uh, addressing and um, is one thing that really fascinated me about Yuri's work and tied into the 311 Tohoku, the Great Eastern Earthquake um, that we'll be talking about here about um, this. I can't even believe it's been 10 years since that hit and the time has just gone um, so quickly, but uh, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing about Yuri's work and um, the way she's negotiated this kind of creative destructive um, dialectic the way uh, the Japanese have through history and the way her personal story embodies this kind of of loss and recovery. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Yudi, uh, you have a very unique family history. I know it came out in your bio a little bit, but your connection to Fukushima uh, and this, the region of Japan and Tohoku is, um, is really quite extraordinary. You are actually from the samurai clan, uh, the Aizu clan that was based in Fukushima. And um, they were exterminated basically during the, uh, the wars that were fought right around the time that Japan became a nation state and uh, in the establishment of the Meiji Imperial Restoration. So um, uh, in a sense, you are the last samurai. Uh, I know what Tom Cruise has claimed, but uh, really you are. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and your connection to Fukushima through uh, your family as the sole survivor of the clan and, and how you became engaged with the Tohoku earthquake? Yes, hi. Um... Well, first of all, uh, my name is Yuri Shimojo, and thank you so much for having me this amazing opportunity. So as um, Jennifer mentioned, yes, my ancestor, my father's side is a uh, samurai. And when you hear samurai, it sounds like a, almost like a um, 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 unicorn, like the <laughs> samurai really exist. Yes, they really exist. And, um, but also my family, uh, my background are very unique. Um, my mother, my, my father was so um, descendant of this Isaac clan, but he was the dentist who wanted to be a vaudeville comedian. And my mother was a social butterfly. And I had a um, 12 years older stepsister who was intellectual uh, disabled. So I grew up in a very unconventional um, background and um, unexpectedly, of course, before I turned 30 years old, they all passed away. So I became a, a, a literary last samurai of my clan, my family clan, and as uh, as I grew growing up, being told, Yuri, um, you need to have keep continuing the family tree, uh, keep the ancestors' legacy. But uh, when uh, Tohoku earthquake um, happened, I was also going through my personal transition, and I. Um, knew that I was not going to um, keep my family tree 
anymore. And also when I saw my birth country was um, going through such a tremendous calamity, I thought my family is gone and now my country was gone. But then um, in around April, I heard the news about Sakura the cherry blossom started to um, blossoming amidst of the debris of the most affected area. And when I was just keep crying, crying every day, but the strength of the nature just gave me so much encouragement. And I decided, okay, I want to, I want to paint again, but actually I didn't know what to paint. I didn't know what I can paint because we were overwhelmed. And, um, but actually I never uh, planned how to paint uh, even uh, my uh, regular practice. I usually uh, wait for the guidance and um, it sounds very sort of like a um, like new agey, but uh, I am um, probably because all my family is passed away. I'm very used to invisible connection, which you could say spirit, but I'm very familiar to uh, communicating, connecting to some something, I don't say somebody, something invisible, but very, um, something very big. And I just trusted my intuition. And one day I was walking my neighborhood in uh, Brooklyn, uh, that time, uh, uh, Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn, New York City. And I saw uh, a cherry blossom uh, tree was uh, fully bloom in uh, New York and I saw uh, petals were falling and I just had this strong connection just looking at the uh, beautiful falling uh, petal here I'm in New York City but my heart my soul is connected deeply to my uh, far away Japan. And so that made me to start just paint uh, petals one by one, like monk is counting bees. That was he very helping me, um, very uh, healing me. And I didn't uh, plan to create the five paintings or this large uh, body of work. I just started to paint the petals. And I thought uh, cherry blossom is sort of, as a motif, is sort of cliche for Japanese, but that's just keep. Uh, this uh, repetitive uh, act was very um, helping me not thinking anything, just focusing paint, just focusing right now. And as I stopped counting how many petals I paint, which is right here, um, each petal started to look like a uh, like woman's body who had to, I mean, actually woman's um, soul who had to leave this world and had to ascend with the loved one behind. And I started to converse with them. And actually people think um, this gray area is the background that I had painted before the petals, but I actually um, painted around the petals 
because uh, Gray, um, I made this semi ink, the Japanese black ink with my, the ink stick, grinding uh, ink stick on the stone. And I had my mother's uh, ink stick that she used to use in a uh, calligraphy box. And I found it and I used for this. And I felt the connection with my mother, that sort of physical connection with my mother because the ink stone, ink stick had the memory of how she grinded. Then we have the Jap Japanese have this uh, funeral ritual that like a, um, we use this gray ink, not black ink for the uh, condolence. I probably it also uh, 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 present tears, but um, so this, I, I, when I um, used this special semi ink, I wanted to wrap around the uh, uh, petals, almost like a tsunami water uh, wrapped around those bodies and softly and uh, honor them, honor the each spirit. And we have the word called kuyo, and Jennifer, probably you could explain that um, as uh, for people who never heard the word kuyo. But so this whole idea was started as spontaneously, but it was, it became my uh, personal uh, requiem for those people who lost their lives and also my personal uh, healing process. Thank you so much. That's, it's both fascinating and, and so moving. I, I'm just uh, <laughs> kind of choking up a little bit listening to it and, and thinking about that process of going through it. Um, I know that we have a, a video of the full range of work so that people can see them. I'd, I'd love to cue that up now. And then uh, you and Ying can talk about more about the specific works um, that you're showing, but thank you so much. That was really beautiful.
every time I, uh, every time I see this, Yuri, I still get emotional. And um, this montage, I think, is a really beautiful representation of how far these works have come. Um, and I just want to also thank the incredible composer and musician and, and environmental activist, Ruichi Sakamoto, uh, who was a friend of Yuri's and uh, pens this beautiful poem that you see at the end um, for Yuri. And uh, Ruichi and his wife, Narika, have said that this poem travels with Yuri wherever she goes. Um, so it's, it's just such a beautiful gift. Yuri, um, can you talk to people about, at the essence, what does Memento Mori represent for you? Oh, I think you have to unmute Yuri. Memento Mori means when you Google it, <laughs> it says, uh, remember your mortality. But yes, remember your mortality. But that means remember your life, how you remember your everyday life, and how lucky, how miraculously we live every day, we wake up every day. So I know actually death for everyone, and it's actually death is everywhere but so that we have so lucky to have everyday life that's for me whatever we have going through this uh, magnificent nature always show us how we can reverse the resilience and strength and heal ourselves and that life cycle for me that's memento mori and with covid hitting this yeah. brought new meaning for you um can you talk about that a little bit yes so i was in the middle of epicenter in new york city and actually i painted this different and uh, latest body of work which is i was just painting line. So these body of works I painted right after uh, Tohoku uh, earthquake, which is, yes, so 10 years ago. So these are um, 10 to eight years ago is my uh, body, work, body of works at that time. And they are the first um, uh, body, of, body of works that I could face death, life and death personally and collective through art first time in my life. And yes, it has so many stories, so many dramas, so many lives. But during the COVID, we had unprecedented um, time that in my neighborhood, we heard uh, sirens and um, so many uh, voices hearing every day and uh, almost less than 20 blocks away, 1,000 people dying every day. And that surreal time, everybody was uh, scared what's going to come and going through the future and then the regretting past and reminiscent past. I, all I could do was I wanted to be just right now here. So I started to paint just lines and which probably uh, if you're interested, you could see um, from um, another website. But um, anyway, the COVID told me um, how we can be at this moment, this, this present, and this collective uh, disaster, we all share the same uh, magnitude, rich and poor, what religion and that, but um, we're going through the issue of those uh, 
uh, differences, but um, we all die because we all born. And I think that universality, I always believe in if we all human can be in the same um, place one day, I think that this um, memento mori that um, life is so ephemeral and so precious and we are so lucky to live here right now in connecting with this Zoom. Yeah. I think that's what I strongly reminded during the COVID in New York City. Yeah, and that's why this invitation from Jennifer to share the story and, and your work with uh, the Duke community and beyond is is just such a wonderful opportunity. And not to say, not to even speak of the fact that today is the one year point of when much of the U.S. went into lockdown from COVID. Um, so we'll talk about kind of the importance of this date after, but. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to emphasize in this exhibition is that despite all of these massive numbers that we hear, you know, reports of millions of people who have died and um, around the world, that each person is a spirit, is a soul, and that we become very numb to this, you know, the, just a number. Um, so this additional site-specific installation that we are about to share with you is um, a brand new work that we have created for the Boston show. And so it did not show in uh, the previous iterations of Memento Mori and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so I wanted to give all of us watching this very special online viewing. Um, it's called Petomori and it's a, a light projection um, created by the musician Maria Takeuchi and it also includes a contemplative soundscape composed by Alec Feldman. Um, so every night if you're in the Boston area uh, the gallery will show this at about 4.15. Um, it's 108 minutes long which is a very important number, especially in Asian and Dharmic religions. Um, and it's going to really affect you. So just get ready for this uh, very short sneak peek, um, uh, but enjoy. That was just absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I, um, I'm not sure if people could tell, but that light show is illuminating 
petri dishes with sakura petals in them with the cherry blossom petals, um, some together, um, some individual and uh, picking up on that motif. And, and um, I remember you had mentioned to me that sometimes you thought of the two petals together almost like a mother and child. And um, it's even in those amazing floral vortexes, it, it really strikes you how you have the multitude and then you have the individual and every little bit of this total universe, um, it, it really captures that, that, that spirit and the power of, of that, of the together and then the delicacy of, of each petal there. Um, and of course, the, as you said, the reference between permanence and ephemerality um, that, we, that we always see. Um, a, uh, a colleague recently gave me a collection of tanka of short poems, which are like haiku from Japan that were written soon after the Tohoku disaster. And one really stood out to me as I was rereading them that tied into the cherry blossom motif. Um, I, I just like to, um, to, to read it to you. It's by Toko Mihara and who was from Fukushima and she wrote it in May of 2011 and it reads, still after all spring has come again, dimly shrouded, <laughs> blossoms of Fukushima, plum, peach, and cherry. And there was something about that starting line, still after all, um, that one wonders if spring will come sometimes in, in these moments, and yet it does come. And uh, it allows us to kind of think through that moment of renewal. And uh, even though Fukushima is, is still shrouded, the, the blossoms are still shrouded and people are still struggling in Tohoku, but they're still very resilient. And they're, um, these memories and the memorializations that we experience in, in every year and it, certainly at the 10th year anniversary are so important for commemorating that, uh, that collective and, and the individuals there. And, and it of course overlaps, as you said, with COVID right now, which we're, we're all experiencing and um, both as individuals and, and in our communities. Um, I certainly saw that with 1923, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there's so much more we could discuss on this, but I, I, I just wanna um, go back to Ing and ask you a little bit more um, about Praise of Shadows because I, I, I know, uh, Praise Shadows Gallery, because I know you're, you've are you been working hard for your artistic community. I wish I could be there in, in, in Boston to see this, but um, tell us why you decided to locate in, in Boston and what the symbolism of Praise Shadows is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I am from Brookline, Massachusetts. I basically moved back to where I grew up and I decided to move here with my children and my husband, who is class of 98 from Duke, Trinity class of 98. Um, and we decided to leave New York. It, you know, just kind of was a point where we had both um, reached a point in our careers that we could do our own thing. And so I had started a company called Prey Shadows Art Partners in 2018, which was a consultancy. I never intended to open a physical space because in New York, that was just impossible. But, you know, honestly, Jennifer, speak about opportunity during a pandemic. Um, my gallery is literally a pandemic gallery. My amazing landlord, when I asked him what the lease was, said, you tell me it's a pandemic. Um, I have locked into this scenario that I never imagined for myself. But what I did imagine for myself is crafting something in my vision and my point of view. And um, there are a couple of things that happened. I um, you know, have been working with artists for a long time and a lot of artists that I work with are people of color or women and just very much people that the art world, the traditional art market has long, long, long overlooked. And um, when the pandemic hit, there was so much that was shifting in the art world. And I knew that there was going to be an opportunity in cities outside of New York City and LA um, where perhaps it could work if, you know, I knew that there was a strong community and tradition of art patronage, which Boston definitely has. Um, I knew that there are incredible museums all over Boston. You turn a corner and there's another museum. You turn a corner and there's another museum. I grew up going to these places. Um, but I also knew that Boston wasn't really known for um, gallery hopping scenes. You know, it, it, that's something you do when you go to 
Chelsea in New York. So um, I, I decided to do this and it kind of surprised me as much as surprised everybody else I knew, but I knew that I was gonna get a pandemic rate for my lease and that I had artists that people wanted to see. And with the murder of George Floyd over the summer, that really kind of accelerated my thinking because I knew that I had people that needed to be seen. I knew that they had art that needed to be seen. I knew that they had stories that needed to be told. Yuri's Memento Mori is prime example, you know, it's never been shown in the United States before. And we, um, she and I have discussed very early on, we need to show Memento Mori. And I also said, you know, we have two, uh, we have two slots. One is March 13th, March 11th, and one was another date. And she said, well, it has to be March 11th, because as you may know, which I kind of had forgotten, it's the 10 year anniversary. And so that, that really just solidified things. Um, but just super quickly, you know, the name Praise Shadows comes from a book called In Praise of Shadows, which I read in art history class in college. And um, it's from 1933. It's by the Japanese um, philosopher Junichiro Tanizaki. And when I met Yuri for the very first time in her studio, um, she introduced her paintings to me and she said, the first place they were shown was at the Honen Temple in Kyoto, where Tanizaki is buried. And we both just cried because it, here was something that I had been kind of, you know, taking along and kind of in my mind and trying to figure out what to do with. And here was Yuri in the exact same space. And so our worlds collided in that way. Um, so I, I'm super blessed and we've had incredible support from the museum community in Boston and uh, from people all over the world, truly. So I, I think we're showing that there's a new shift in how people are approaching contemporary art and how, um, you know, the market is, is changing. COVID has changed everything. And I'm, I'm really excited to be um, part of this experiment. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind of one of those moments where I, I feel like going back to where I came from, which is, you know, Duke and this community and you, Jennifer, um, I am just very grateful for this talk and for this community. Um, I, I was reminded that you participated in a Duke alumni event at the Boston, at the MFA Boston a few years ago. Um, and you were, when you were serving as Dean of Humanities at Duke. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. Boston is a great art town and um, particularly for Japanese art, you have the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which is the best collection of Japanese art, bar none. Uh, I love it. And it was just a great opportunity with the Alumni Association. We had an event at the MFA and I had the privilege of sharing the stage with Anne Nishimura Morse, who's the senior curator at the MFA. And I think many people in this community know her very well because of her incredible work for decades. And at that time she had just curated a show on photography from the Tohoku disaster called In the Wake. Um, that show was incredibly moving. And, and we talked about the power of art and storytelling and particularly how art has always been a means of telling stories about Japan, especially abroad, and um, how it's talked about Japanese identity and it's told stories about Japanese experiences, the diverse experiences of Japan and, um, and it's changing experiences and identity over, uh, over the centuries. Um, Japan is not what it was a millennia ago, it's it's constantly evolving. So that was um, just fantastic. And, you know, for someone like me, um, coming from art history and visual studies, I just can't emphasize enough how important it is for students in our community to um, experience art as part of their education and to see different mediums and to engage all of their senses when they're thinking about these major historical events like a disaster, because we're, we're human beings and we are cognitive and intellectual and we're also multi-sensory. And what we do is so, it's so important to, to be able to, um, to, to respond to things with all of our human senses. So um, probably should stop right here because I realize we want to uh, open up for, for questions and uh, Q&A from our audience. And we have quite a lovely audience out there. So um, Nina, feel free to send me your questions and um, I will happily pose them to the group. 
Um, so uh, one question was asked, is the time spent painting the work similar to the time you might spend uh, in meditation, Yudi? It, does it have a kind of meditative component to it? Well, definitely. I mean, I definitely. But um, I think I used painting as my meditation method probably before I learned the word about meditation because I've always painted, uh, I mean, I've always used uh, painting and uh, drawings as um, sort of uh, protect to my own uh, realm from the environment, the mm -hmm. chaotic environment often since I was a child. So um, I think that's, I call meditation. I mean, to center yourself because I used to, I still sometimes, but I used to have, um, I used to uh, stutter and that's from my, um, um, since child, childhood. And also I really try, um, the words are sometimes very difficult for me to explain, express my emotion, feelings, or what I try to say. And paintings and drawings are always helping me to communicate with other people. So that's also communicate with myself. And I think that's what meditation is. Mm -hmm. to always ground yourself. Another uh, person asked, they said they see a recurrent uh, motif in your paintings that looks like an eye. And they wanted to know, is it evocative of vision in particular? Is, is that what you were trying to point to or does it just seem that way? I think so. Yeah, many people uh, refer, it uh, reminds them that I and I think that's definitely true. And it doesn't matter that was my intention or not. <laughs> and I really enjoy, I mean, actually I appreciate every viewers have their own way of translate my work because I believe uh, they are, they are the important of those abstraction works are the mirror of the viewers. So I think it's more important than what my intention was. However, <laughs> because of I said intention, this particular time, I definitely wanted to focus about individual. Hmm. Because we hear um, um, the uh, surreal number of the death doll. So that's my only way of um, I'm asking uh, audience to think about the individual uh, among these 500,000 people or more. But going back to eyes, I definitely honor each people's way of translation. Um, somebody asked, because you had included the poem by Ryuichi Sakamoto, whether the music was also by him um, and whether he had composed anything for you. That was actually back. <laughs> and, um, he, uh, that was, he, he, he performed for uh, Glenn Gould. Um, yeah. But he yeah. were but Ruichi arranged the Bach um, for uh, for a, also a commemoration. But uh, and then the music within the exhibition is by Alec Feldman, and um, you know Alec is doing this independent independently. But um, they're all part of this Ruichi Sakamoto circle of love. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody was asking whether uh, how you feel about trying to show art in the midst of a pandemic and 
that knowing that less people will see it, although I'm not sure because more people are coming to the Zoom. So you, we, we're, we're trying to compensate. Again, it's one door closes, another one opens. And, and I hope this has opened the door to, to a lot of people. But, but, but as an artist trying to exhibit in the midst of a pandemic, um, how, how has that experience been? Yes, I think this is a great question. Uh, yes, I cannot have opening and oh no, I cannot invite here him and her. But I really, as uh, art, uh, painting drawings were my uh, vehicle of healing, but I believe it also, uh, art is the vehicle, important vehicle for the viewer. Um, so I am so um, grateful that I can share my works, especially this Memento Mori in this timing and in this um, broader audience. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're running right up against time. So maybe we'll just have uh, one more question. And there are so many here that are, are really interesting. Um, but uh, Ing, one was for you about whether the gallery will uh, continue to operate beyond COVID and uh, what's your intention with it? I'm, you are intending to continue to operate, right? Oh yeah, I'm taking this as seriously as any business person is gonna take any business, anything that they've started. I have a five-year lease. Um, this is not a pop-up, this is not a temporary thing. I very much intend to have a sustainable program where we're supporting artists and where we're creating a, a community of people, collectors, artists, museum curators, um, who understand that art is something we have to support. And um, I, you know, I work with, I've been working with Yuri for years and, you know, now this is just coming to fruition. So I, um, I'm here for the long run. And um, just so people know, we are open to the public. You can come, we're open Wednesday through Sunday from 11 to 6 p.m. Um, you know, we do observe social distancing and we do limit capacity, but please do come. It's never really that crowded. Um, and during uh, when museums in Boston were closed, we remained open and people would come in and just be so happy that they could see art in person. And in fact, some curators came in and said, I haven't seen art in person <laughs> in months. So, um, you know, I, you don't have to do anything. Just come show up and we're here. Thank you so much. I'm, I wish I could be there. I would transport myself immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so big thank you to our panelists for tonight's enlightening conversation. And for those of you in Boston area, we hope you'll come and see Yuri's Memento Mori exhibit at the Prey Shadow Gallery. It runs through April 18th. And uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank and extend our gratitude to the many collaborators across Duke who helped us spread the word about tonight's event. You can also stream tonight's conversation along with other episodes of Demon Live on our website. The links are posted in the chat, along with a link to Professor Weissenfeld's book. Um, another link uh, that we're posting is for event on March 24th, where you will learn more about Duke's successes and challenges as a model international institution with its campus in Kunshan, China. And for all our alumni here in the Boston area, look for our next Duke Boston event on April 11th, when we will whisk your way for a virtual tour of Duke's Marine Lab. So thank you again to the panelists and the audience for joining us. Until we meet again, stay safe and stay well.